Uh, this is uh, Dr. Graham Roberts. He is uh, one of the biggest names in uh, European Academia in uh, picture uh, picture analysis or telling a story via picture. He is currently working in Paris Nanterre University. Uh, Paris Nanterre is one of the biggest uh, universities in uh, uh, in France uh, and especially in the field of uh, humanities and uh, liberal arts uh, he is uh, we are very lucky that uh, he is uh, here with us and he will uh, share his experience with us of uh, deconstructing a picture so he will uh, talk about a photographer talk about uh, their work so i'll take it over to you sir and uh, you can start uh, uh, by sharing the powerpoint and uh, taking it further thank you so much wow. Thank you very much, Prabhupada, for that very, very kind, um, very kind introduction. Can you all see? You got, you got, you got my presentation on the screen. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. We can see. Good. Other if, students, if, can you see it? Yes, sir. Super. Okay. I'd like to thank thank Prabhupada for um, in, inviting me today. I'd like to also thank all the students for being here. Um, I hope you find this talk interesting. Um, I certainly have found it interesting actually <laughs> preparing the talk. Um, and so, well, here we go. Um, yeah, this is a story of a picture. It's also, oh, could I, so, before I start, Robert, could I ask you how long I have to talk? So you can uh, take your time. In 30 minutes, okay. uh, I guess you have 30 minutes. Then we can open it to the floor for questions. Super. Super. Um, yeah, I um, the reason I chose this picture was because it's, an, it's a story, not just of a picture, but it's a story of how you can get it wrong as, a, as, a, as, a, as an analyst, as a researcher, as somebody who's actually studying imagery, you know, um, how you can get it wrong if you... Um, Come at a picture from a, from the wrong angle, from the wrong context. You know, um, one of my precepts as an academic and as a translator, as well, I've done some translating, is that there's no text without context. You know, um, and you really have to understand the context um, of you know an image that you're that you're looking at. And it took me a long time to get over my basic assumptions and actually look at the look at the picture properly i'm still not sure i'm looking at it properly but i'm looking at it in a in a, in a way which is a lot better than i used to be looking at it i think i'll explain what i mean um as we go along okay um so hopefully let's see there we go so this is um boris mikhailo boris mikhailo who's a ukrainian um photographer who's been, who now since um, 2022 has been um, living and working in, uh, in Germany, in Berlin. Um, and he was born in 1938, so he's what, 62 plus 23, he's 85, um, there's no spring chicken. He started out as a, um, he started out as a, as an engineer, but he also had, um, photography as a hobby and um, he was uh, he got into trouble with the KGB in the 60s because they found nude photography nude photographs I think of his wife in um, in his flat I don't know I don't know who tipped him off about this but anyway um, so funnily enough, he decided at that point to, to give up engineering and become a photographer full time. Um, he is considered, it's kind of weird really, because he's not that well known outside of Ukraine and Germany. Um, but he is considered to be really the most influential um, photographer working today who, who emerged from, from the USSR, you know. Um, what we what you find is that in the in the West, um, you find that a lot of you know somebody who has had trouble, who has had a run in or several runs in, 
or run-ins, I'm not sure what the plural is, never mind, several runs in with, um, with the authorities in a, you know, a totalitarian state such as the USSR automatically is feted as um, a, an art, a, you know, a thoroughly political artist. Now, I'm trying to resist that, that reading as much as I can because it's a very easy and a rather lazy it's a rather lazy kind of um, you know, approach to take. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to keep my uh, hermeneutic options open, as, as I might say <laughs> here. Um, what, I, what I would say is, um, and we'll see this, in fact, we might see this in the next slide, is that Mikhailov really uh, is very playful and, and um, a lot of what, well, not a lot, but he has debunked himself I am not I. From 1992, he puts himself on um, on stage, as it were, and uh, in very very funny. That's a wig he's wearing, and a, and a, and a, and a, and a toy sword. Uh, there's a whole series of of images of him uh, naked, actually. Um, I'm reminded here of the African photographer Samuel Fossil, F O S S O. I don't have an image for, for him, but you should check him out. He's very, extremely interesting. And um, he also puts himself on stage, as it were. And, um, and one, of the things that's, one of the things that's interesting about Mikhailov is this is clearly a staged photograph against a backdrop, you know? Um, but he, had, he does all sorts of different things. He'll do um, street, he'll, he'll do street photography, He'll do um, surrealist photography, and I'll show you some images of that later on. He'll do this kind of self-deprecatory, you know, staged, staged photography. He's a very, very versatile photographer, um, which is which is interesting, but it's also difficult if you come and get him from a from the point of view, of, you know, as a researcher, because it's difficult to get a real handle on him. Actually, it's difficult to get a real handle on him if. You know, because he is so he is so versatile, and and his, and his work is so heterogeneous. Now, um, you must remember. Well, there, there's a selection of books. There's a selection of books. There's lots and lots and lots and lots of books on him. Many are in German because, um, well, because he works in Germany, and because uh, there've been a lot of exhibitions of his work in Germany. Um, he comes from. He was. He's from uh, Kharkiv, which as you. Unfortunately, no. Now um, I say unfortunately because, well, for obvious reasons, I think um, Kharkiv is uh, to the east of uh, Ukraine, and um, the Kharkiv school. Roman Piatovka was another uh, another photographer. Uh, they take very, very bizarre. They used to take very strange, very bizarre photographs. This is a photograph of uh, two, no, three naked women jumping off a jumping off a couch in the middle of a Soviet flat. Very, very strange, very, very kind of surreal. And yet, well, of course, surrealist, surrealist, the whole point of surrealism is you get two very ordinary images that are juxtaposed, you know? Uh, um, so, you know, um, this is a very, you have to have a very ordinary back, back cloth for surrealism, which is my Magritte's paintings, Magritte's images, you know, the scenery, the, the the landscapes of Magritte's work is very uh, are very very banal and ordinary, and this it is you couldn't get more banal in in Ukraine in 1988 than than the inside of a Soviet flat. You know, um, again, I could have I could have shown I could have I could have thrown this image at you and said let's do the story of this image, but I'm not <laughs> perhaps another time. And um, you should remember, um, I don't know those of you I, I I don't know how many of you know the the USSR. 15 republics founded in 19, at the end of the Russian revolution in 1917, you know, the late, late 1910s and um, fell apart um, in late 1991. Um, Soviet photography, photographers were forbidden to take photographs from a position higher than the second floor. Don't know why the second floor. Uh, or of buildings, or uh, or of railways, of military objects, or enterprises without permission. Now, I re I've realized as I was preparing this talk that um, I broke all of those rules except for the military objects rule when I was a student in in Moscow in the mid eighties. <laughs> but thankfully, they didn't kick me out. Um, 
serve, um, it was also for, for, forbidden to take photographs that brought into disrepute Soviet power or the Soviet way of life. Um, and it was also forbidden to depict any naked bodies. So uh, Piatovka's picture, uh, which is actually called a witch's Sabbath, by the way, um, was immediately, would immediately have been forbidden, obviously. So um, back to, back to Mikhailov. Um, he, in the 1960s, late 1960s to the, uh, to the mid 70s, he produced a series called Red, which is where he, most of the time, these were uh, ordinary everyday images um, that he colored and he colored in red, of course. I, well, I don't know, I say of course, but of course, I don't know whether you know, but the red was um, the most politically um, charged color. Um, since it was the color of the Soviet flag, it was the color of the labor movement, still is the color of the labor, mo labor movement. So on um, the image on the left, of course, you just have one particular object, um, primarily anyway, colored in red. On the right, we have an image um, from the same series, which in an interview in the, the British newspaper, The Guardian, recently, Mikhailov said was his favorite uh, photograph. Um, of, of you know his most success, his most his best photograph. He felt it was his best photograph. Um, so, which is I, I think quite interesting. It's a very striking image, certainly very striking photograph. And here are more. Here are two more um, images from that series. Um, and as you can see, well, you can see already that he's very he's a very heterogeneous photographer because these images there colored and and this is very very you know obviously but there's there's some super superimposition going on there so there's something very there's an artifice which is foregrounded whereas in these images of course um there is no there is no artifice uh, yes we have the angle we have the we have you know shot from shot from ground level but nothing is nothing seen appears to be colored in uh, and this 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 picture on the um, bottom right there we have um, some young Soviet Soviet recruits, um, and one of them's kissing a flower, which I'll come back to that actually. We'll come back to that later. It's quite interesting in itself. Um, so, and here here are the super, superimpositions. It would be so easy to uh, superimposition work, color photography from again from the 1960s to 70s. It'd be so easy. To look at the image top left and say, oh yes, this is about walls having ears. This is about you know everybody was listened to all the time. I I like to resist that kind of reading because it's a very easy Western liberal kind of lazy kind of reading, which I don't want to I don't I don't want to impose on that particular image. I like very much the image um, bottom right, which um, is which shows a you know a typical Soviet freeze. F R I E Z E, obviously, that you could see in, in so many buildings and so many murals and so many metro stations, um, with a very interesting, um, you know, projected onto projected onto this head and this bust, uh, which again actually would have been very interesting um, to um, to propose for today's talk. I think um, one of the things that fascinates me is you know the meaning of how meanings change um, from how meanings change uh, depending on whether you know about the context or not. You know, I used to have um, I had an old teacher of French literature when I was at school who used to always say, and "This is a very new criticism kind of approach." You know that um, the work of art should 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 mean without should mean without uh, having without you having to know anything about the context. Well. Mm, it's not always that simple, and especially with photography. Um, but the look, the look in that in that in that man's face there, in the man's eyes, um, bottom bottom right, and also what the red does. It looks like he's wearing. It almost looks like he's wearing. He's he's he's, he's uh, wearing clown's makeup, which is um, which is very interesting. And of course, as I always say to my students, nothing you see in an image is ever a coincidence. You know. Um, so that's very so that's and it's in in a way it was also extremely interesting. Of course, this was all this was already in the sixties and seventies. This was f um, flying in the face of socialist realism. Socialist realism was all about was supposed to be all about 
showing the 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 the, the revolutionary future in the everyday, and nobody actually ever knew what that meant. <laughs> nobody ever actually knew what that meant in the Soviet Union. But certainly, this kind of formalist, form, formalistic approach to to art and imagery and photography um, was uh, ipso facto um, ideologically, politically incorrect. You know, politically incorrect. Um, the late '60s was a time in the in the USSR when people were being um, when there were show trials to experimental writers of well, writers of experimental fiction were put on trial and one Andrei Sinyavsky was um, put in prison for nine years for writing science fiction. Um, so it was quite brave of Ikhalov to to produce this kind of photography at the same time. Unfortunately, I don't know. Um, I don't know, I know little about the publication of these photographs at the time. I don't know whether they, these were, you know, he processed them himself and kept them in his drawer. I don't think so. I don't think that's what happened. But I, 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 I'm not 100% I'm not sure about that. Um, there was a gritty, what I call a gritty realism. Um, to, there's a gritty realism to a lot of his work in the Soviet, in the Soviet era. So, you know, you're, on the one hand, you have this kind of surrealist playfulness. And on the other hand, you have this kind of this very gritty realism. This is, you know, this is, uh, and, and he tended to take photographs in, in, in what used to be called the Ukraine, but is now called Ukraine, in Ukraine, because it's a country. If you say the Ukraine, then it's a region of a larger country. I don't need to tell you the implications of that particular, you know, that particular um, so in Ukraine, he 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 restrict not restricted, but he limited himself, he limited himself to taking photographs in Ukraine, and this is um, people swimming in a lake, um, right under the in the shadow of a of a of a factory, you know, in the 1960s. So you can imagine all the kinds all kinds of pollutants that were in the in this river. Um, but people seemed happy. The woman in the the woman in the uh, in the foreground on the left seems perfectly happy. But there we are. So this that's the kind of grit, and also the the patina, the kind of almost sepia toned, the sepia toned um, nature of the photograph is also very very interesting. He took a whole series of this kind of imagery. Um, so, and you then you get gritty realism in the post Soviet era. This is uh, from the series The Theater of War. Second act time out from 2013, okay, which is uh, in Kiev, and um, just prior to the Maidan pro um, protests of 2014. I'll pass on from that to um, case history, Kharkiv, 1997 to 1999. Another very good example of post Soviet really realism. These are real. Um, i.e. I, not staged, not actors. These are real homeless people in Kharkiv. You know, homeless, alcoholic, alcoholics. Um, the look, again, the look in the eyes of the man on the left, um, this is not staged. This is, this. you know, these are homeless, homeless alcoholics or homeless people who have um, um, psychological, psychiatric issues. Of course, from... A certain perspective, you might say, "Well, this is this is voyeuristic. This is unpleasant. This is this is almost grotesque." But there is a tradition of this kind of photography in uh, in Ukraine, and um, I can I, I'm happy to give you a reference to a contemporary photographer who's doing something very similar um, in Ukraine right now. Actually, I'm happy to give you that as um, towards the end, if you like, later on at the end of this talk. Um, so yes, so the look, and, and what fascinates me about Mikhailov's work is the look, you know, uh, also, um, you know, very, it's very intriguing that the, the, the look on the left and the man on the left is, is rather empty, it seems to me. The look of the man on the right is very, very different, very ambiguous. And the look of the woman, of course, on whose lap he's sitting is also very, very interesting. It's very, very difficult to tell, unless you know. Whether the, whether the image on the right is staged or not, you know, to what extent is it staged? To what extent is it a snapshot? What's going on? Where are these people? 
What's their relationship? Who are they? What's their relationship between the photographer and, and, and the subject, etc.? And that's again something which we'll come to when I look at the image that I want to focus on today. So he asks all sorts of questions about what photography is and about you know the viewer, what I'm doing as a viewer, and what's my context, and what am I, you know, how how do I read these images? And, I, you can't look at me, it seems to me, you can't look at Mikhailov without asking yourself, how am I looking at this? What am I, what am I trying to, you know, what is, my, what is my approach as a viewer? And how do I react? And how do I, how do I relate to um, the subjects? It's a very, very, I'm going to make, perhaps it's a cliche to say this, but he's a very human photographer. He's a very compassionate photographer, I think. In a way that someone like Martin Parr that you may that you may know of, Martin Parr, Pierre de Boulard, um, is it's not actually. I think Martin Parr is um, contemporary British photographer. It's quite is, is actually arguably interestingly much more voyeuristic than than um, Michaela. But of course, that's open to debate. That's my own particular view. Um, 2000 to 2010, Tea Cafe Cappuccino, which is again a gritty realist, a gritty realist um, view of um, contemporary, well, not, not quite now, but um, 21st century Ukraine and 21st century Kiev in particular. Um, he, he has also, Mikhailov has also um, gone some way towards query masculinity. This is Men's Talk 2011, and this is, he took a series of photographs of, of two men who um, shared a prison cell. That's a real prison cell. Um, a very, um, very, um, very interesting and very intimate um, photographs, which was really a kind of a new departure for Mikhailo. And again, there's this, there's this um, really, really strong, if I can call it that, strong ambiguity right the way through, or ambivalence. I'm never quite sure whether one should say ambiguity or ambivalence. Let's, let's say ambivalence. There's a really strong ambivalence about, you know, are they acting or, or, or is it staged or are they actually, you know, is it real? And I've tried to find this out for today's talk, but I couldn't find out actually. I couldn't determine whether or not these are, you know, these are actors or if it's actually more if this, this is real, as it were. Um, I'd love to, I'd love to be able to say one way or the other, but I'm afraid I can't. Now, um, this that brings me closer, ever closer to the picture I wanted to tell you the story of today. Now, this Luriki from 1971 to 1985. Um, so we get this is the Brezhnev era in uh, the USSR, which was known for, uh, as a very repressive, culturally, very repressive era. Zhmuriki uh, is the word meaning those who wink, and it's the word that um, grave diggers, it's, the, it's the, the nickname that grave diggers give to the dead. <laughs> and Luriki then is a neologism that Mikhailov um, uh, came up with. Um, looking to refer to his own his um, his photographs, the one, and what he's done is he's, he he colours them, but particularly the redness. And you've got um, you've got Soviet iconography here. You've got the the image on the left. This is the um, this is the entrance. This is the huge statue that some of you may know of. It's the the huge statue of the worker and the peasant with the hammer and the sickle. A huge statue at the entrance to the park of economic achievements in Moscow. And we have people posing in the 19, possibly 1950s. Um, it's a, it's a, a photograph that he has, that Mikhailov has, has found, it's a, an objet trouvé, and that he's colored. Again, on the, on the, on the right, we have a, a Soviet soldier with a doll, holding up a doll. And that brings me on to that. I, again, once again, I almost could have, could have chosen this picture to send, to show, to, to discuss today. Um, again, um, it you know, the thing about this particular image is obviously um, there's the contrast between the soldier uh, and the doll. Yeah. Um, there's the the way this, the the soldier is looking at this, 
and the contrast between the soldier's eyes and the doll's eyes, um, the obvious coloration that's gone on in the background and also the redness there, and the, the pink lips and the red lips and the blue. Um, that brings me, that, that, make, that reminds me that um, the codes of masculinity in the USSR were one, not the same as the codes of masculinity in many other cultures. Um, I'm thinking in particular of the Northwestern European culture that I'm from. Um, and two, were actually different within the USSR itself because the USSR had um, 100 and I don't know how many, 160 million, possibly more, actually close to 200 million inhabitants and stretched across 15 republics, uh, stretched across 15 republics, um, and that's just the smoke alarm going off. My wife's cocking, so please, um, it's don't be alarmed. Uh, no pun intended. Um, stretches for 15 republics, uh, which went bit, which um, which contained at various times up between eight and eleven time zones. You know, so it's very difficult. It's very difficult. In fact, it's impossible to talk about the masculinity, the Soviet masculinity, without taking into account the fact that there were. Well, over 200 million people living there and stretch a, a, a country that stretched across, well, an empire, an empire that stretched across 11 time zones. Um, so uh, the, the, the Mikhailov calls these, calls these luriki, which uh, refers to the fact that these are objects, these are found objects, these are people who he, he didn't know who they are. Um, they were, in one sense, dead. To him, and as much as he didn't know, you know, that the, the, there was, they were anonymous. They were anonymous. Um, they are all snapshots. Well, actually, yes, they are all snapshots. And there's all something strange about them. And that that reminds me of um, there's almost something. Well, that, there's almost something camp about about these in the Sontag Sontagian sense of there's there's something which is not quite right. There's something which is strange, which is odd. Um, you see that especially in the picture on the right hand side with the doll. Of, although, of course, again, um, this is, you know, there's something odd if we take this out of context. You know, we, what is the context? We don't know what the context is. So we have, to we have to impose some kind of context on these images. And when we do that, well, inevitably we find them, we find them strange. I mean, you know, but, um, now, that particular, I mean, if you like, I look back, this particular image here um, is one of the images which has, has um, occasioned Mikhailov to be compared to the Sotsart movement. The Sotsart movement was a, was, um, a movement um, that really came to prominence in the 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, I think it's had its third glory now. Uh, now. But um, the Sotsart movement was a movement which, which parodied Soviet art and Soviet culture by throwing um, throwing socialist realism back back again back against it well, back against itself yes so using the visual codes of Soviet socialist realism to parody the whole um, the whole idea of socialist realism so on the left we have Alexander Kasolapov who has Lenin and uh, Christ walk striding side by side and of course red. <laughs> Red, um, holding the baby Mickey uh, Mickey Mouse by the hand. There we are. And on the right, we have uh, Leonid Sorkov standing in Monroe from 1991, which which was the iconic image used um, to publicize an exhibition of of um, post Soviet Sots art, um, Sots from Socialism, socialism in in Russian, which. Um, showed at, um, at a very a lovely um, museum in Paris, La Maison Rouge, which sadly has now closed. But that, that image there on the right was the, was the iconic image for that whole exhibition. Yeah. So again, there's something, there's something odd, there's something out of kilter, there's something awry, there's something askew, there's something not quite right about these images, which, which, which does link them to um, the Sontagian notion of camp. Now, um, that brings me back to, there we are, this image again. Um, now, um, what I'd like to do is, first of all, 
show you how easy it is to go down the wrong path when you're trying to look at these images and you're trying to make sense of them. I looked at this image, um, but just to say, by the way, that this, these are two uh, sailors from here. It's the Pacific Ocean Fleet, Pacific Ocean Fleet. Um, we've got blue there, colored in, the green, the red, um, possibly the black there, the red again, the yellow. So it's a, there's something, there's an artifice. There's an artifice about this. I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that this picture, like the other pictures that I showed you from the Luriki, was was originally black and white. I suspect it was originally black and white. From a from a you know, um, and this was you could you could this was quite common in the Soviet Union. You could get you could you could walk in. You had walk in. Um, where somebody would take your photograph, which is almost it's almost like a passport photo, except you know those. Except it's you know without, without having you know one person climb on top of another like this. I mean, I remember using, I remember to have getting my photo taken in one of these. And in the days, you know, you walk in and it was very quick. One of the, one of the very very few cases in the Soviet Union where the queue wasn't very long and you take very long. Um, and it was a black and white image, and it was quite it was quite nice. It was a war off black and white image. So anyway, um, my you know, and and it, they they homoeroticized the sailor. Um, this is that image on the right is very 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 typical of of Piaget of their work, and they've worked a lot with or they've 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 worked in parallel I think with Jean Paul Gaultier, the uh, French um, fashion designer. That on the left, that's an image. Um, as a photograph of Jean-Paul Gaultier taken by Pierre Gilles, very, very camp, very, very, very camp. On the right here is a publicity photograph for Jean-Paul Gaultier's perfume, Le Mal, you know, um, and the sailor, again, camp, really camp, um, homoerotic image of the sailor, um, using or wearing rather, wearing Jean-Paul Gaultier's trademark uh, Marinière, which is a sailor's, a, a French sailor's stripy, stripy top. So I had these images in mind. If I, if I, if you allow me to just go back a second, I had these images in mind when I looked, when I saw, not that image, when I saw this, you know, when I saw that image there, I very much had that image there on the left, less so, partly also the image on the right. Um, I had Jean-Paul Gaultier in mind. And I, you know, I really did go down uh, the wrong path, I think, because there's nothing intrinsically. Now, now I'm getting into, um, I'm getting into hot water. Well, not, not hot water, but I'm getting into a minefield now. I'm going to get into a hermeneutic minefield because I don't think there's anything intrinsically camp about this image, unless you're a Western queer theorist. You know, now the of course the question that you that you do, uh, then arises is well, does it matter that there's nothing? You know, is there anything intrinsic about an image, or is you know is it is it in, can you take an image out of context, or is is there always a context to interpretation? Is it? Um, I'm trying to phrase this articulately. Please forgive me. Um, what I mean is. If those of you who know new criticism, you know new criticism in, in in the states between the two the two world wars in the twentieth century it was all about you know close readings of the text with zero consideration of any biographical information about the author or any historical, social, economic context. It was all about the text, you know. New critics. Um, or oh, um, claim that you that you know not that you just could but you should interpret the the text the novel um, by paying close attention to the language and expunging from your interpretation all context you know um, so new criticism rested on the assumption that that a text had an intrinsic meaning an innate meaning um, if you transpose that to visual you know visual culture is it possible is it possible to, to analyze or to discuss or to interpret? I, I prefer the word interpret to analyze. Is it possible to interpret an image 
with no consideration of context. I don't think it is. So then you might say, well, why were we talking a couple of minutes ago about the intrinsic meaning, the innate meaning of, a, of, a, of, a, of an image? Well, it's very, it's, it is very difficult. And I'd love to have your, I'd actually love to have your, your, your opinions on this um, in a few minutes when I, when, I, when I finish my talk. You know? And what I find particularly fascinating about this image is the, there's so much that's artificial about, not just coloration, it's a snapshot, it's a portrait. Um, these two young men are looking at, they're looking at, uh, at the picture, I'm oh, sorry, they're looking at the, at the photograph. They're looking at the photograph and um, there is, you don't know what the, you don't know what's, what's there. You don't know what's there. You don't know um, the, 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 the look in, in, their, in, in both pairs of eyes is very, very open to interpretation. And as, and as to say, of course, is the use of the teddy bear. Um, just before I, this is my last slide, but one, just, just to say, um, I'm just, so I'm gonna wind up in a couple of minutes now, is that it was very common in the Soviet Union to see um, young sailors or young soldiers like this walking around the streets of Moscow holding hands. And of course, I was twenty. I was in my early twenties when I when I first saw this. And of course, I immediately thought, "Oh, is that interesting? You know, are they gay? Oh, I thought that I thought I thought homosexuality was was banned in the Soviet Union." And then, of course, I realized that well, actually, these are these are young kids from from Central from the Central Asian republics. You know, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, etc. Um, for whom holding hands was you know two men holding hands has nothing sexual. Um, so that's what I mean when I say that, you know, the codes of masculinity are radically different from the codes of masculinity I'm used to as somebody from North, Northwestern Europe. Um, so, you, you know, it's very difficult to get a real handle, a real hermeneutic handle on, on this. But it's very, very important because this image raises all sorts of questions about how we read, you know, how we construct queerness, how we construct queer, queerness, how we, how we, um, assume queerness in images and how important are the context in which we interpret is. Um, that's a, a long quotation. I don't normally put long quotations in, but I think that, um, you know, Bauman, Zygmunt Bauman, I'd recommend you read him because he's very, 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 very bright, very clever, very sharp, at the same time, extremely accessible. Um, I read Ultimately, I read Mikhailov as somebody for whom the fragility, temporariness, and vulnerability of masculinity is absolutely central. There we are. That's fragility, temporariness, and, and vulnerability of uh, masculinity is very, very, very central. So that was more or less all I had to say. I haven't spent that much time talking about the image. I spent a lot of time talking around it. I hope that was uh, interesting and clear as much as I made it. Um, yes. This is there's a there's a tour one one hour fifteen tour um, of a recent exhibition of Mikhailov's photographs in Kiev. Check that out. Um, there's I've, I've inserted the hyperlink into the image, but I've also put that at the bottom. Fascinating, brilliant. It's in English. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to uh, answer them. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the talk. And uh, I think uh, a lot of things they might uh, uh, take into perspective uh, because they themselves have been on a project on interpretation of the same. So uh, any questions, anyone? Maybe shall. Uh, students, you have any questions or shall we call it a day? I have no idea whether you, you know, whether your students, um, whether any of this is familiar to students or not. I think uh, they're not very familiar with uh, Ukraine and uh, obviously mm -hmm. Soviet Union. So, but uh, I think uh, uh, the idea of uh, maybe looking at a picture and how a picture of one photographer relates to a picture of another photographer and uh, a lot of contemporary art and photography movements, they... Uh, perhaps would have helped them a lot. 
I thank you so for your time, and uh, it's been a pleasure as always uh, to listen to you and uh, to take in uh, all uh, the information that you are passing on. I would request you to share the PowerPoint presentation over the email to us so that I can I will email you mail the it to the students as well. And Sorry, we can have a look Sorry. Sorry, Prabh, but I thought you finished. I will. So I will very. I will definitely email you the PowerPoint, and if. If your students have any questions at any time or any comments, then um, please feel free to give them my email address, and I'd be I'd be very happy to hear from them. Uh, sure, sure. All right, sir. Really, okay. really. You know, I'm always happy to discuss, as you know. I, right. um, you know, so anytime. Sure. Happy to see you again, sir. I'll meet you, you too, soon. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so Bye -bye. much for your invitation. Thank you for your time. Take care.